Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast episode number 464 for the 10th of September 2017. Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia. It's a very nice day outside, a nice sort of a late winter, early spring day. A bit of smoke around, they're doing hazard reduction around Sydney, so the smoke is wafting around. Maybe I should do a separate podcast on weather reports. Coming up on this week's show, we're going to kick off with a fun adventure I had with the Stranger Things Down Under Facebook group, Alethea Dean and Lara Benham. And I took a car out to Kashula, southwest of Sydney, for the Oz Paranormal and Spiritual Expo. As a modest, um, spiritual, new age sort of fair, where we chat to some interesting people selling UFO paraphernalia and ghost hunts and uh, all sorts of things. And I do enjoy those adventures with the Stranger Things group, and uh, I I do love going to paranormal-type expos. And uh, we discussed this. We didn't record it, but we will discuss it a bit later on with Alethea Dean. One of the people we spoke to was a lady who was convinced... uh, that the crop circles were signs from aliens. And when we suggested to her that uh, you no longer hear much about them in the news, they're sort of old hat, you know, something from the really, from the last decade, she was a bit upset about that and, and insisted that uh, they're uh, as much around as ever, but you don't hear about them because the media is uh, suppressed, gagged. <clears throat> And that was all because I was wearing a crop circle tie. I was wearing a crop circle tie because earlier that day, yesterday morning, I went to the TV studios of Channel 7 here in Sydney to record a segment for the Weekend Sunrise program, Live to Air, where I was chatting about the Australian Skeptic's $100,000 prize. And at the end of today's show, the last segment is me um, on that show, the audio from me on that show, chatting about that prize. Also, I will read out the newspaper report, or the online report, I should say, that led to that uh, TV appearance, and I'll give my thoughts on uh, the process and some of the people who have applied for the $100,000 prize, all of that at the end of the show. Somewhere halfway through the show, Iran Sagev chats to Dr. Karen Landsman, Uh, an Israeli doctor who is very pro-vaccination and doing a good job. And halfway through their interview, it's interrupted very rudely by Fraser Cain from the Astronomy Cast program. I don't know why, what was happening. Anyway, the interview itself is is, uh, very interesting, of course. A grain of salt with Iran Segev. As ever, we have an episode of Brouhaha Science. This week, Ben Lewis will discuss ageing. How old can humans age? How old will we get? Can we live to 200? Is 100 uh, enough? How old will humans be with Ben Lewis? Also this week, I chat to Chris Higgins from the UK, who is helping to organize Skeptic Camp in Manchester, happening just before QED. Uh, QED, one of the better skeptical conventions anywhere in the world. If you're in Manchester, if you're going to QED, or even if you're not, you might want to go to Skepticamp. All that information's coming up. Now, as promised, we'll keep you up to date with the continuing saga of Dr. John Peace. He is the GP you remember from the last few episodes of The Skeptic Zone that was... uh, at a screening of the movie Vaxxed some weeks ago, stood up and outed himself as an anti-vaxxer who helped parents avoid vaccination for their children. This story update comes to us, published only in the last couple of hours, at the Sydney Morning Herald, smh.com.au, by Nalia Chahan. And it says, Medical regulator, police, raid anti-vax GP John Peace Mitchum Clinic. The medical regulator has raided the clinic of an anti-vax Melbourne GP seizing computers and patients' files. Dr. John Peace, who is temporarily suspended while being investigated for helping parents sidestep the no-jab-no-play laws, said the Australian Health Practitioner Regulatory Agency raided the Narinda James Natural Healing Centre in Mitcham on Friday morning. 
A Victorian police woman spokesman said police accompanied the medical regulator to the practice. The story goes on. Victorian Health Minister Jill Hennessy said she was deeply concerned Dr. Pierce had continued to practice after years of disregard for community safety. Quote, his arrogant boasting against vaccinations are frustrating and irresponsible, end quote, Ms. Hennessy said. Now, the story does go on. Uh, there's a lot more to it than I've read out to you right now, but I'll certainly link to that in the show notes. That's enough for me at the moment. I'm going to run downstairs and uh, see if those cats are happy because Henrietta and Maud, the skeptic's own cats, have just had their breakfast. But as soon as I open the door, they're going to tell me they haven't, of course, and they forgot all about that breakfast of uh, 20 minutes ago. I'm going to run downstairs. I'm going to have my own breakfast of an English muffin with a bit of butter and some quince jelly. Why, I enjoy all that and a cup of coffee. Why, I enjoy all that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. On Saturday, just yesterday in fact, I went with the Stranger Things Down Under Facebook group to the Oz Paranormal and Spiritual Expo at the Kashula Powerhouse, Kashula being southwest of Sydney. It was a great day out with uh, Lara Benham and Lethia Dean, both happened to be also part of the Australian Skeptics Committee, and what fun it was to drive down in a little pink mini. I chatted to Alethea on the way into the expo. Today we don't have a stall, we're just sort of coming along to see what we can find. There's a lot of cars parked here, so presumably a lot of people inside. But we shall go in and see what we find out. See what the spirits have in store for us today. Oh, crispy. Yes, the um, the Casula House... Casula Powerhouse's very own in resident spirit, Crispy yeah. the Ghost. Uh, see if he's around to greet us. Sounds like a breakfast cereal, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're in the uh, powerhouse now. It's pretty full. There are lots of stalls here. I'm looking at uh, crystals that seem to be lit up, uh, little figurines of gnomes and goblins. Uh, Alethe, you just had a, a talk about colour therapy. Uh, what's that what it was? <laughs> What did she tell you? Um, I don't know. Um, there were English words involved, but... Um, OK, something, something. My intuition has a colour and it wants to speak to me and she's going to give me a consultation and the discounted price would have been 35 bucks, and then I would have, I think, had a bottle to spray stuff on my chakra. I'm not sure if I actually get to go away with the bottle. I always thought your chakras yeah. need a bit of spraying, Alethea. don't even know which chakra... I can talk all night. And, uh, all the, uh... <laughs> We've come across a wonderful stand here selling Thank all sorts sir. of uh, aliens. Look, it's, it's an alien band. We've got a, a saxophonist, a guitarist, a keyboard player. Yeah, they're all greys. We call them greys. Grey they're aliens. about four feet. Oh, that's a beautiful yeah. one. He's listening to his headphones, about four feet tall. Uh, we've got uh, UFOs, little models of UFOs everywhere. Yes, of course. And, and what about this? An alien in a coffee mug. <laughs> That is pretty funny. This is, this is my favourite. That's very good. That's that's. I would almost say that's a lifelike alien, man. A little model of a, a grey alien. You've got a big Area 51 model here. That's it, like this. That's the sport model. Wow. Wow. I that can go faster than a of light. That looks fantastic. He's holding up a, a model of a classic flying saucer. That's it. It looks terrific. And uh, how long have you been interested in aliens and uh, UFOs? Last 10 years. Yeah? yeah? Yeah, I've been studying them. Really? What have, yeah. what, what have you did, discovered? Are there many uh, UFOs been, in Australia? I've been recording UFOs last 10 years. Yeah? In, in Australia or around the yeah, world? Yeah, in Australia. Then yeah. I went to my country, Turkey, uh -huh. Istanbul. I saw there a couple of them. Yeah? And I was nearly getting abducted there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well... It's a bit noisy in this room. They're making all sorts of announcements. But I do like your setup. Do you have a web page? No, I, go, I am on Facebook. You're on Facebook. How, yeah. can, how can we find you? Uh, Sydney UFO Club. Sydney UFO Club. Yeah, all my uh, captures, UFO videos, all there. 
You can wash them all. That's great. Thank you very much for that. No worries, sir. Sydney UFO Club on Facebook will definitely give it a look because I am so impressed by all the, the wonderful aliens. I think I'm going to have to buy one, actually. I, I'm so impressed by these wonderful aliens. Thank you very much. No worries. So much to see here today. And what do we have here? Moonlark. What's Moonlark all about? So Moonlark Media is a small family-based uh, media company that focuses on spiritual and paranormal content. So we do a lot of documentary series um, focusing on um, ghost stories and paranormal stories as well. And you've, you've told me you've just recently come back from places like the Czech Republic. Yes, yes. So we went to the Czech Republic as well as Hungary, Slovakia and the Ukraine. And in the Ukraine we specifically went to um, Chernobyl, the site of the nuclear disaster in 1986. Yes. <laughs> Was that as creepy as it sounds? Absolutely. So it's this entire city that's been completely abandoned and forgotten by time and um, by people. People have returned after the disaster to try to take take back some of their um, items, but they were highly irradiated, so it's just, yeah, it's insane. So a lot of places that we visited were just um, left as they were. Yeah, so we visited, like, for example, the hospital. Um, there were, you know, surgery beds and um, medicine cabinets and old records and whatnot. Oh, yes, um, and I'm just uh, being alerted here to a photograph of one of these wards. Yes. Abandoned ward from Chino, because you have a wonderful display of very um, atmospheric photographs. You're a photographer, I take it. Yes, yes, I'm a photographer. So I mostly focus on um, documenting in situ. So basically a scene that is the way it is, and I take a photo of it to basically record it. That's my job. So I'm a documentarian. That's great. And how can we find your things online? Um, so you can find us through Moonlark Media on Facebook and um, the Primal Investigator series on Facebook as well. You can find me on Instagram, um, so Urban Dystopian. Um, should be a little picture of me um, with the Ferris wheel from Chernobyl in the background. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the, the, the quickest way is to look for uh, Moonlark on Facebook yes. and people can take it from there. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. <laughs> what a fascinating table. It's the APPI table we've got um oh australian paranormal phenomenon investigations try to say investigators try to say that three times quickly <laughs> and i'm looking at little ghosties that change color a little skull there there's various uh, ghost detectors and and look look a boo bear yes <laughs> what can you tell me about the boo bear okay so here's um a very interactive um tool that investigators use so um he records, he speaks, he will tell you um, temperature fluctuations. So if it's getting colder or hotter in a room, yeah. he'll ha have a little announcement for you. You can plug him in and download all the information um, that you've recorded on him. Wow. So Yeah. So the and it's just is, like a, a, a teddy bear. Yeah. Pretty much. So the idea is you can set him up, leave him in, leave him in a room. Um, you can come back and you can download all the info, see what he's said, see what he's caught. Um, and because he talks and everything as well, you can kind of hear him saying things that are going on so you don't have to so you know, be sitting there watching. You're in another room, you can hear this bear talking to you. <laughs> yeah, and especially in a place like this, we have, um, we have a little ghost that we... Um, have here a is little that girl. Crispy, or is that another one? That's another one. That's another one. That's oh. another one. So the girl's been sighted actually a lot, and she's in the old Victorian style dress. Um, and we had a few people up on the balcony just behind you say um, they've seen this little girl peering around corners at them, they've heard her rolling balls and bouncing balls and going to chase them. So we like to think that this one's really good for any of the, the littler ghosts that we might have floating around. Um, and even just because it's interesting, like, you don't really expect, like, a teddy bear to be in, like, these, you know, older kind of Last places chance. and everything Last like that. to get tickets for Brian's talk, which commences right now. $25 for an hour. Brian's our New York special guest. Come out and get your tickets out the front. I think we're safe now. We're safe, we're safe from the loudspeakers. We're probably safe from the ghosts. How can people find out more about your uh, organisation? Oh, there's a few different ways. Facebook, I always say, is the best one. So just jump online, facebook.com slash appyghost.hunts or um, we've got appyghosthunts.com um, or you can always come and 
um, come view us at one of our venues. We've got over eight venues now that you can come and see. We've got tours and ghost hunts happening. So depending on what you like, um, tours will give you a little bit of the history and our own experiences and guest experiences. Hunts are a little bit more in depth where we'll take you through the history and things as well, but we'll also um, hand you equipment, we'll teach you how to use it, and then we'll take you out and try and find some ghosties for you. That sounds just the ticket. I'll, I'll have to tell my friends at the Stranger Things uh, Down Under Facebook group. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Over for another year, we're just strolling back to the... Oh, it's a pink mini. Doesn't that look great, Alethea? It's beautiful. It's Over beautiful. It's beautiful. It's the selection of... Um, merchandise i bought a guitar playing alien and a light up ghost Ooh. now we met somebody interesting in there when we were just chatting around some of the people uh a lady took a, a notice of my tie which is um, crop circles and uh, proceeded to tell us I, I said to her that oh you don't hear much about crop circles anymore and she looked a bit horrified no, because um, apparently there's there's lots of news about crop circles. It's just suppressed by mainstream media um, because of fake news. That's what she told us. and then she, In her words, that's exactly what she said. And she proceeded to tell us about a guy who's coming out here to talk about it. And I said, but he's, he's not being repressed. You know, he's talking. How does that work? Um, but you can tell he's totally legit because he has two diplomas from Caltech. Yes, that's right. So... <laughs> What a fascinating time it is. And as we always say on the Skeptic Zone, if you're thinking about going to a psychic fair, do. By all means, go along and ask questions and see what it's all about. I think that's that's pretty important. It is very important. Um, and I, I think the reason we generally have a good time is most of these people are really genuine and positive about their beliefs. They're having a good time, so it's very easy to just go with the flow and enjoy it for what it is. It certainly is. Oh, well, until next year when I think we might even have another table here. Uh, that's always a I lot of fun. I think we definitely should. I think we should. Signing off from the Paranormal Expo. Sziasztok! Всем привет! Hey, Salihu! Guys, guys, I just had the most amazing experience. What experience, Andras? Andras, have you been to the pub? I told you not to hang out with Marsh. You know he was blessed by Peter Popov. <laughs> no, Yelena, I'm not talking about psychics. It was a real ESP experience. Uh, you have been to the pub. Either that or you've been smoking something. No, Pontus. The ESP is the European Skeptics Podcast. It's the most amazing thing. You get to know so much about skeptics and their activities across Europe. You know, events, hot topics, and interviews with lots of interesting people. Oh, wow, cool. By the way, Pontus, you just committed the false dichotomy fallacy. I guess that means I'm really wrong. Yep. And you can even learn about those fallacies on the show and hear about people spreading silly ideas. You should really check it out. It's the ESP, the European Skeptics Podcast. It's on every week. All right, so where can I get this ESP experience? It sounds good. You can go online at theesp.eu, follow it on Twitter at espodcast underscore eu, or like the podcast on Facebook. Oh, and you can also contact the show by sending them an email to info at theesp.eu. And if you want to subscribe, do a quick search for the European Skeptic Podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Stitcher. Make me crazy. I don't know how you can believe. Grain of salt, grain of salt, grain of salt. Grain Let's all take this with a grain of salt. Is Iran sick it? Grain of salt now, grain of salt, you can take it with us. With me is Dr. Karen Lanzmann. Um, whose first um, sentence when we met for the first time several years ago was um, that her favorite disease is the plague. The Black that, Plague. I'm not, not sure, I'm not sure whether it was your name first and then the plague or the <laughs> plague first and then your name. <laughs> so, do you want to start by telling me about your interest in the plague? <laughs> 
would I start by introducing myself? <laughs> no, you're Dr. Karen Lansman. That's enough. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. So my interest in, a pl- in the plague started when I was uh, 12, I think. I ran into this book. I started reading this book about great plagues in humanity, and I discovered that something that we can't see can destroy half of Europe within four years. And it amazed me, the power that things so little have on, you know, on everything, on human beings, on history, on everything. The society changed because of the plague. So, and it's an amazing disease of its own, but, you know, the, the influence is what matters. Okay, so did you, first of all, that's how it became your favorite disease? Yes. Okay, great. The way to become now, my favorite <laughs> disease is to have major influence in human history. Okay. To note if any disease is listening. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and did that influence the, you becoming a doctor? No. I wanted to become a doctor way, way before that. This is why I opened the book to begin with, that book. Yeah. Just a second, let's uh, take a uh-huh. Hello. Uh, excuse me, who are you? you what? Can you interview for the Australian Skeptics? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can I do you as well? <laughs> okay, so we, we've just yeah. been interrupted by Fraser. Do you want to join us? Oh, t- no, I, c- I can't. We're talking about the Black Plague. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> but, but I told you about it. What specifically? <laughs> okay. Kind of just no, I, I don't want to interrupt your... Somewhere, interview. somewhere wanna, between I beer and listen. grizzly bears. I just want to listen to this hilarious interview. <laughs> no pressure. No, I don't remember. He's uh, Richard's going to cut it out, right? Maybe. <laughs> oh, God. There's no way Richard's going to cut this out. No way. Hi, no. Richard. This is all staying. This is all definitely staying in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. So, is, so yeah. you wanted to be a doctor, yes. which is why you opened the book, yes? Yes. I wanted to be a doctor since I was four, since my uh, pediatrician... Uh, excuse me for a second. No, you, you can't leave now. No, I, I want to speak to you. I do you have to leave. But you, you want to do the Australian skeptics. Thank and you, anytime you want to have me on the show, I'm there. Uh, no worries. <laughs> Thanks, Fraser. Bye. Great. He said he can't. We'll have to take it as a given. Okay. Okay, so that was uh, to all our listeners. That was a hello and quick goodbye from Fraser Kane. Okay. Okay. Back well, to you, Karen. Back to me. <laughs> you opened the Where book. Where was I? Yes, I was four. Yes, when I was, um, I decided I wanted to be a doctor when I was four because my pediatrician always gave me um, uh, candy at the end of each visit. And then I understood that doctors are nice people who give kids candies. And I decided that this is what I want to do when I grow up. Okay, so uh, the thing is, um, anti-vaxxers would have you believe that doctors are those nasty people who um, jab you with a needle the size of, um, of a major artery. Um, and I'm talking about major artery as in a, a ro- major road, not a major uh, artery in yeah. the body. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You don't agree? No, not, not really. No, my okay. view of doctors is a bit okay. different. Okay, so tell me, tell me. About, okay, so, uh, so speaking about the anti-vaxxers, um, you, you've had uh, some battles with them in Israel. You've been involved with the. Yeah, it's the, all your fault, you know. Okay, tell me about it. Because <laughs> you went to Israel a couple of years ago and you told us yeah. about the problems of, with anti-vaxxers in Australia yeah. and of children dying of pertussis in Australia. Yeah. And this got me interested in the in the vaccine situation in Israel, which I haven't been paying that close attention before we met. Okay. And then we met, and I looked into the data, and I was horrified to find out the, the, how horrible things were. I, I was horrified to find out the pockets of anti-vaxxers in Israel, which cause a very low vaccination rate in the population where outbreaks came out, outbreaks of pertussis, and we recently have outbreak of measles. And I became very involved in 2013 when we had a silent outbreak of polio. When the, we, we, they discovered polio virus in the sewers, uh, they found out that there is a problem with vaccination, with the vaccination status of some of the children in Israel, and started, the government started a nationwide campaign for polio vaccination. And a lot of people were against this vaccine. This vaccine, which I got, I vaccinated both my kids, is essential. It prevents death. <laughs> it seems so 
it's so reasonable to vaccinate. And I, suddenly a huge movement came out and said no to vaccine, no to the polio vaccine. This is when I got involved, really involved in the campaign pro in the pro vaccine campaign in Israel. Okay. And me and a couple of my friends, uh, we were very involved in that campaign. And later we founded a volunteer organization, which is dedicated to improve uh, public health in Israel and to increase vaccination and rate. the name of that organization is Midat, Midat. which yes. uh, just roughly translates into informed. Informed or knowledge, yeah. 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 Um, so what, what, what do you guys do at the moment? Are you, are you active at the moment? Or? Yes, unfortunately very active. Uh, we currently have an outbreak of measles and lately a couple of uh, uh, cases of uh, chickenpox. And pertussis is always a problem. So we, we have a couple of levels of uh, activities. We, we are both, uh, we have a very active group. We have the largest Hebrew active group in, uh, about vaccines in Facebook. We have a very active Twitter account. We have a huge site with all of the material regarding vaccines and preventive, medica- preventive medicine um, uh, with all kinds of areas and we give lectures and we give lectures in schools and we give lectures to nurses and doctors and we have leaflets and we answer parents uh, questions and we give talks and interview on the radio and everything that we can in order to increase vaccination rate because we want to protect children that's a very important goal. Now, is it uh, true that uh, some of the anti-vaccine um, component in Israel has to do with religion, like the ultra-orthodox um, uh, yes. have lower immunization rates? Yes, we have three major groups of uh, people who do not vaccinate. Uh, one is uh, ultra-religious uh, groups in which we have no way to communicate. Um, one is the high socioeconomic status that we know from other anti-vaccination movements. And the third is a very large group of people who just don't have access to vaccines for all kinds of reasons. Either they're from very low socioeconomic status or have many kids and just don't get enough time to get to get to finish vaccinations. So, so it sounds like these would be the easiest ones to get to somehow because they they do not they, they, they don't object no they, they just, don't object to vaccines they just need access to yeah. vaccines and and they are the easiest if the government does yes. something to uh, increase access what we do in those cases is try to uh, talk with nurses and see if we can help somehow um so so in that case, would the main focus for you would be the high socioeconomic people who think that Dr. Google can cure them yes okay. Or uh, not necessarily, but a lot of people who are vaccine hesitant, uh, which I'm sure you have in Australia as well, uh, parents who are very worried about their kids, who read, who listen, who actually take very, um, uh, who are very interested in everything that has to do with health, which is good. I want people to get to, to make informed decisions about their health. But I think they should do it with a professional, with their pediatrician, with their nurse, with somebody who knows the child, who can give counsel according to the child's status and not somebody on the Internet. So how do you go about it? Well, we do it in several ways. Uh, One is give lectures in school and give lectures to parents and answer you know, the usual questions about vaccines and why we should vaccinate and what are the most co- common claims against vaccines, and we try to give answers. The second is the, is the Facebook group. We have a couple of thousand people, I don't remember how many thousand, uh, parents coming to ask questions, and we try to give them access to, you know, give them links to the CDC or pediatrics or, you know, proper um, Sources, and we try to calm them down and always uh, refer them to their pediatrician. Always. We don't give counsel on the Internet. Yeah. And, uh, the thir- and the other component is our website, which contains a lot of information about every vaccine that is given within routine and, uh, other, and some special vaccine given in Israel. Now, you're an epidemiologist, right? Yes. By, by Yes, this is my specialty. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
does that help you in understanding what needs to be done and where the focus should be in terms of uh, dealing well, with anti-vaxxers? Yes and no. <laughs> This is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so being a medical doctor an epidemiolog- and an epidemiologist helps me understand the, the background, you know, the, the professional background. I understand why the vaccines are given, when they are given, and why specific vaccines were chosen and others were not. I can understand that. I can even understand the way they are budgeted, the, the way they are and budget yeah, the yeah, yes <laughs> um, it the way the the way to communicate with parents comes from the clinical experience less from the epidemiological point of view and more from the m- clinical medical experience when you talk to a parent in the ward or in your clinic and you understand what are their concerns and how to answer them and how to Um, how to give them more uh, how to calm them down and how to give them more knowledge more access to knowledge that they are looking for so uh, is there do you at the moment or do you just go about the normal things you do or, or is there anything that you plan to um, is there a campaign that you're planning or anything like that or are you just going on about the, your daily uh, uh, daily well, life in terms of uh, fighting the anti-vaxxers in Midat or in my private life well my, pers- my, per- uh, 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 My, both. both. <laughs> so Midat is always planning. Um, we have um, a going back to school campaign. Um, it's August. We're going back to school in uh, September. So we are getting ready to um, to all kinds of questions when because we have routine vaccinations in the first, uh, the second, and the eighth grade. So we are pre- preparing to answer questions. We give uh, short briefings to everybody in the group if they want it for routine questions, the normal questions. We have new pages on our websites, which right now I can't remember which they are, even though I, I approved them. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Because everything my dad publishes goes through me. And um, in my personal life, I just watched a total eclipse of the sun, so I'm happy. And it has nothing to do with the anti-vaxxers. <laughs> It's a lot happier, right? Yeah. yeah very good. So in, if uh, uh, people want to uh, find you, they can go to the Midat uh, website and your Facebook page. Is that correct? The Facebook page is called either Kehilat Midat or... Um, parents talking okay. about vaccines okay and so it, we'll, we'll put those in the show notes anyway uh, is there anyone else that uh, they can find you or is that it I think that's about it okay <laughs> Karen Lanzmann thank you very much thank you and now direct from the cafe at Australia's science channel It's brouhaha, science in less time than it takes to order a coffee, with Ben Lewis. It's a literal fight to the death. Groups of scientists all around the world are locked in it. For years, they've been trying to work out whether there's maximum age for humans. And Dutch statisticians think they've confirmed the answer. 115.7 years for ladies and 114 for gentlemen. This backs up a study from last year which came to the same conclusion. 115 is as old as we'll get. Sure, life expectancy is increasing, but the age of the very oldest people hasn't increased. And that, the scientists say, points to some kind of wall. But oh boy, researchers love to argue about this. Some say there is no limit, and a steadily increasing lifespan shows that. Previous supposed limits have been proven wrong and disregarded. You just need to wait long enough. And last year's study was criticised for flawed statistics. We know better than to stick our nose in a fight where it doesn't belong. But dogs, mice and plenty of other animals have age limits. It's not a stretch to think humans might too. So carpe diem, science lovers. For more brouhaha and Australian science visit www.australiascience.tv or visit Australia's Science Channel on Facebook. Save the date, 
Psycon is returning to Las Vegas for 2017. Today, you turned on your computer or your phone and Facebook told you that vaccines are an evil government plot. Twitter told you the sun is revolving around a flat earth. And the House Science Committee told you that climate change is nothing to worry about. Meanwhile, up is down, true is false, Oceania has always been at war with East Asia, and dogs and cats may in fact be living together. Enough already. It's time once again for the forces of reason and science to come together. Time for critical thinkers to connect, learn from each other and sharpen their skills. Time for the leading lights of skepticism to share their wisdom and rally the troops. It's time for PsyCon 2017 back in Las Vegas. October the 26th to the 29th, join luminaries such as James the Amazing Randy, Richard Dawkins, Eugenie Scott, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, Susan Gerbeck, Harriet Hall, Richard Wiseman, Carrie Poppy, Joe Nickel, and many, many more. The Master of Ceremonies is none other than George Harab. For the biggest Skeptics event of the year, returning triumphantly to the Excalibur Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, the City of Illusions, PsyCon 2017 will be packed with fascinating talks and presentations, dazzling entertainment and fun social events with fellow Skeptics. This October, get away from fake news and conspiracy theories filling up your news feeds at PsyCon 2017 your alternative to alternative facts. For more information, visit www.csiconference.org. Joining me now on the line from the UK, it's an old friend of mine, Chris Higgins. Hello, Chris. Hey, Richard. How you doing? I'm doing really well. It's great to be able to catch up with you. I haven't seen you for a while. And I well remember the time way back in, oh, was it 2010, that you were chosen as the wingman for James Randi during his Australian visit. I don't think I don't think I've ever heard that called wingman before, but I wish I'd thought of that. That's the best. <laughs> I said I used to tell everyone it was assistant, but wingman's so uh, much better. You were because we needed somebody uh, just to help Randy with sundry items to organise things, to look out for him, and to do stuff like that. And you got to spend um, uh, quite a whack of time there with uh, Mr. Randy. Yeah, all through Tam. That was. Uh, it feels so long ago now. I suppose yeah, it was, wasn't it? Was, it? It's like yes. seven years now. <laughs> feel old oh that, dear, well randy i think he just turned what 89 or something like that yeah but that that was an exciting time for everybody and uh, having spent time with james randy myself it's 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 quite an experience indeed now i'm uh, ha- having a quick chat with you today because as we mentioned last week on the skeptic zone coming up in manchester in october we have the qed uh question explore discover uh, conference weekend, which is fabulous. It's one of the better ones in the world, I think. But just before, absolutely. yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. But just before, in fact, um, the Friday, Friday the thirteenth, leading up to QED, uh, there is Skepti Camp in Manchester. What can you tell us about that? So uh, Skepti Camp is. Well, I mean, Skepti Camps have been going for sort of, uh, I think, about ten years now. Reed uh, Reed Esau started the concept. I think back at one of the big Vegas TAMs, actually. Um, but uh, the guys from QED wanted to put on basically an unofficial third day of the conference. Uh, so so QED runs over the Saturday and the Sunday uh, of the weekend in October, the 14th and 15th. Um, and it's obviously jam-packed with speakers and events and panels and all, all different stuff. Um, but what we wanted to do was actually have a, a sort of community day on the Friday, and, and Skepticamp was sort of the perfect fit for that. So um, it's, a, it's a free event, completely free, whether you're attending QED or not. If you're in Manchester, you can just come along. Um, but obviously the, the great thing about Skepticamp is you don't have to just come along and uh, attend. You can actually submit a talk and, and give a presentation. 
Yeah, that's really the, the the idea. You can go along and enjoy it and just hear people talk. Or if you so desire and you have something to say that you think might be interesting to a general skeptical audience, uh, it's, this is your – really, it's your opportunity. And, you know, it doesn't have to be – a huge, uh, a huge in-depth talk on a particular subject. You can speak your mind. Uh, I think it's it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, the general public to see what it's like to to give a bit of a talk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the talks we kind of cap them at. Uh, everyone gets a fifteen-minute slot, uh, and the way it works, it's based on the um, the ignite format, which is essentially you get ten minutes for your talk, and your side, your excuse me, your slides are set to automatically advance. So every twenty seconds, your slide changes, and that kind of keeps the pace up. It really <laughs> keeps the energy in the in the talks, uh, and, and it stops people from just kind of getting stuck on one particular slide and then running out of time. So it really just gets that momentum going. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Wow, that's that's interesting. I have not seen that particular system in action. Uh, the last, if I remember correctly, the last time we had Skeptic Camp here in Australia, I gave a 10-minute oh, talk or something like that. Uh, I just sort of made up on the spot about what it's like to bend spoons on radio, and that sort of worked. I remember that talk. I think that was in Sydney, <laughs> it Sydney was. Skeptic Camp. It was. <laughs> So, I mean, that's pretty bizarre and out, sort of a bit of out of left field. It sort of does cover skepticism. But it's a sort of interesting, quirky um, talk that you might not hear in a full-blown skeptical convention. Are you planning to uh, give a talk? No, I'm uh, – well, I'll, I'll, we'll see. But uh, I've done this for, for kind of three years now and, and never done one, so I'm sure ah. I'll get dragged up eventually. But, uh, no, at the moment I'm just looking after hosting and all that kind of stuff. But I think you're right about the – it's almost um, – it's the wrong word, but the, it, it tends to attract like fringe topics. You know, people – you know, when you go to a skeptics convention, there's lots of talks about the sort of traditional stuff, whether it's alt-med or whether it's kind of psychics or magic and, and all those kind of sort of staple topics. But last year we had a, a, a talk about cannibalism. <laughs> um, we had uh, uh, talks about brown M&Ms. Um, there was a musical number, Good grief. which you'd very rarely get you know, at a, at a, uh, at a skeptics convention, but um, you get some really interesting sort of off-the-wall uh, off talks. Wow. Wow. It, it sounds like something I should, uh, I should attend myself. In fact, um, I should uh, try and get myself over to the next uh, QED maybe in 2019, Definitely 2018, should. 2019, 2020. I've been trying to, uh, I've been trying to razz up all the, the Aussie rogues to, uh -huh. uh, to get up here, and they keep saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do it next year. But <laughs> there's, uh, there's not nearly enough of an Aussie contingent at QED, so we oh, need I, a few more. I totally agree. There's a, just a little matter of a planet in the way, that's all. That's, <laughs> that's the yeah, only no. problem. <laughs> A small, small issue. <laughs> a small consideration. Well, Chris, look, all the best with it. Now, if people are going to QED or if you're in the general Manchester area on Friday the 13th of October, this might be the day for you. You don't have to be attending QED. How can people find out more, Chris, and how can they uh, book their uh, 15 minutes of fame? So there is a website at skepticamp.co.uk. Uh, that's got all the details on it. It lists the uh, the details of the event, where it is, uh, when it is, what time it starts. There's info about how to submit a talk and the talk formats that I explained earlier. And you can just drop all your details in there and uh, and register. The uh, We're about half full at the moment. So we've still got another oh, wow. four weeks to go. Um, so the, those, those speaker slots are actually uh, disappearing quicker than I expected them to, which is great. Well, that's a good thing. But there's your cue, uh, people who are going to be in that area and you want to give a talk uh, the time is now to act to make sure you've uh, locked in your your slot for Skeptic Camp well Chris I wish you all the best with that I'm sorry I can't be there uh, but I look forward we'll see you next year Richard I look forward it's <laughs> no pressure <laughs> I look forward I look, do look forward to giving a presentation one day at Skeptic Camp in Manchester but for now Chris Higgins thank you very much cheers Richard QED 2017 is fast approaching and you don't want to miss it. 
In the past, QED has brought you the Arrows of Time, the origin of recording, an escape from the Westboro Baptists, the sex bias of sex science, and all manner of other science, pseudoscience, activism, slacktivism, and more. Plus, insects for breakfast. Mmm, yum. QED 2017 takes place on the 14th and 15th of October in Manchester, England. We've already announced speakers like Sophie Wilson, co-inventor of the ARM computer chip, Simon Singh, who will be showing how to crack a genuine Enigma machine, Phil Scrayton talking through the real-life cover-up of the Hillsborough tragedy, and physicists Helen Chersky and Tim O'Brien. We'll have a live show from the Parapod Boys, and the whole event will be emceed by ace magician Dave Anik. Have some laughs, meet some new friends, make new connections, all for only £109, including all the main stage talks, panels, podcasts, workshops, our Saturday night entertainment, and lots more. Check out qedcom.org for details. We'll see you in October. Australian sceptics are in the news, uh, this time at the ABC, abc abc.net.au, a story out of Melbourne. Paranormal proof, Australian sceptics' $100,000 prize, still unclaimed 37 years on. And this is by Simon Leo Brown, published on the 4th of September 2017. There's a $100,000 prize waiting for you. If you can read minds, see the future, or talk to the dead. As long as you can prove it, that is. Submit your superpowers to scientific testing, and if you pass, you'll be the first to win the prize in its 37-year history. The Australian sceptics have offered the money to be awarded to anyone who can prove they have psychic or paranormal powers since it was founded in Melbourne in 1980. Quote, you get a lot of claims about people being able to read people's minds or heal people from a distance, end quote. Australian skeptics Victoria's Terry Kelly said, adding that most balked at the challenge of confirming their claim. Quote, it actually has to be proven in the way that any other scientific claim would be proved, end quote. Magicians versus psychics. With their focus on science, you might expect most active sceptics to be doctors, scientists, or academics. But Mr. Kelly, for example, is a social worker who joined the movement 20 years ago after seeing unscrupulous people take advantage of his grieving clients. Quote, You had people who lost a child going off to see clairvoyance, claiming the clairvoyant had spoken to their dead child, end quote, he said. Mr. Kelly said many of those active in the skeptics community were comedians, professional gamblers, or magicians. The movement counted such names as Tim Minchin among its supporters. Professional gamblers were rarely superstitious, Mr. Kelly said, and understand the probability and chance. Magicians have to balance their work as skeptics with their professional code, which demands they never reveal their tricks to the public. Groups of magicians sometimes excuse themselves from skeptics' meetings to hold private discussions on how a display of the paranormal might have been faked. Water diviners are regular challenges. Canadian-American magician James Randi launched Australian skeptics when he was brought out by entrepreneur Dick Smith to test the claims of water diviners. The then $50,000 prize was short of the $1 million offered by Randy's own foundation. However, it has not been on offer since Randy's retirement in 2015. Water diviners have since been the most active participants in the $100,000 challenge, as it is known, submitting their dowsing techniques to scientific testing on several occasions without success. Paying winner would be worth the money. Mr. Kelly said there had been fewer challenges for the prize in recent years, and Australian skeptics' groups have been focused on debunking claims of homeopathy practitioners and anti-vaccine campaigners. The $100,000 is still up for grabs, however, with a number of benefactors guaranteeing the prize. Quote, They're reasonably confident that they won't have to contribute, so it's not that big of a risk as far as they're concerned, end quote, Mr. Kelly said. Quote, if anyone did actually prove some sort of paranormal power, 
it would change things so dramatically in certain areas that probably then they would consider it worth paying the money. End quote. And that report comes to us from abc.net.au. I'll link it to that in the show notes. Over the years that I've been involved with the Australian Skeptics, we've seen uh, quite a few people come and go who wanted to uh, claim the $100,000 prize. Most of them, as the article suggests, have been water diviners. More and more, when uh, we offer people who claim to be psychic the the prize or the money, they uh, reject it out of hand. I think, after all these years, a lot of them have seen that nobody has claimed the prize, so I guess they must assume that the money isn't real, or we cheat, or, or, well, whatever psychological tricks their brain plays on them to try and excuse them from uh, applying and you can only push it so far. You can offer somebody the prize, $100,000, and they turn it down. Or you can politely try again. But there comes a point where uh, there's this magical line reached, and then they'll decide that uh, they'll play the victim card. Those uh, evil skeptics um, bullying me to take their money. I know it doesn't exist, or I'm not interested, go away. Uh, evil skeptics are hassling me, something like this. Or or they'll turn it around and they'll use the Victor Zamet uh, prize. I think that's still a million dollars of anybody who can disprove his claims of the afterlife. Of course, we know science doesn't work like that. And indeed, our chief investigator, Ian Bryce, at the Australian Skeptics here in uh, Sydney, once went to a talk by Victor Zamet and pressed him about the details of this prize. And it soon turned out to be uh, extremely vague and wishy-washy and according to his own criteria. And again, anything to do with science has long since evaporated. If you Google Victor Zamet uh, psychic prize or prize for the afterlife or something like that, you'll, you'll see this. But it's used. It's used quite often. In fact, over the years, uh, when I've put our challenge, our prize money to various psychics, they'll immediately turn it around and say, well, the, the skeptics have never passed our test as if it's a valid test. Well, there are many misconceptions, of course, but one of the uh, the major ones is that uh, psychics think that skeptics um, rig the prize or the challenge so the psychics cannot win. We get comments along the lines of, oh, we don't do things to your rules. Then it's explained to them that uh, any tests are done under mutually agreed conditions. In other words, the uh, uh, test doesn't go ahead until the claimant is very happy with the conditions, and they feel confident they can pass. Which is interesting, because another uh, misconception is that uh, one size fits all. In other words, people have the impression that there's only one test we conduct, and uh, which is, uh, of course, nonsense. Uh, So a frequent question is, well, how would you test a psychic? And, of course, there's no answer to that apart from, well, it depends on what the psychic is claiming uh, under what conditions they can do their claim, how uh, how accurate they think they are. And in fact, I have here one of our uh, little leaflets from the Australian Skeptics that we hand out at things like Paranormal Expos. Uh, Australian Skeptics, Inc., $100,000 prize. And it says, you uh, if you are applying for this prize, we need to know three things. And then we can sort of continue... One, what exactly is your claim? Two, under what conditions can you perform or demonstrate your claim? And three, what success rate do you expect? Now, it's uh, it's amazing how many people cannot answer the first question, let alone the next two. I think one day we'll have to uh, write an article or a list or something of all the reasons and excuses people have come up with for either not applying for the test to begin with or the reasons and excuses they have for failing. Water diviners especially are just uh, renowned for their wonderful creative excuses for failing. And this speaks a lot to their sincerity, because uh, it's psychology. If, if you know you can do something and suddenly you fail, 
then your brain will race for a convincing explanation to you, at least, as to why you failed. And any anything will do. That's why it's true. Some water diviners have claimed interference with uh, electric cables overhead or or anything. As long as it makes sense to them and their brain satisfied that they have an excuse for a failure. But the prize continues. Uh, I know James Randi has retired and the $1 million prize is not being offered at the moment uh, in the form that it once was. But the Australian Skeptics $100,000 prize uh, is still on offer. Although it's not a worldwide prize. In other words, you have to be... Um, in Australia, making the claim in Australia, of, uh, you have to be Australian. It has to be Australia-based, really. We, we can't uh, have it worldwide. The logistics would uh, make that too difficult. Having the $100,000 prize in the news in a news outlet led to other uh, media outlets picking up the story, and I was contacted by the Weekend Sunrise program on the Seven Network here in Australia. And uh, just yesterday morning, I went into the studio bright and early and appeared on the show to talk about the $100,000 prize. The hosts were Andrew O'Keefe and Monique Wright. And the other guest on the show was Ruth Phillips. Now, $100,000 is up for grabs, but there's just one catch. You have to be able to prove that you have psychic abilities. The Australian sceptics have uh, had the wad of cash on offer for 37 years, but to this day, no one has ever been able to give them proof of paranormality. There are the psychics and the sceptics, and it seems never the twain shall meet. One side espouses worldly superpowers, making predictions, moving objects, speaking to dead people. I actually make a direct connection with the energy of the person on the other side when I'm doing mediumship. Or unsolved mysteries. Got a man here, and is his name Don or Ron? What's his name? Ron. Did you, did you kill him? My son did. The other, well, they're sceptical. So sceptical that the Australian Skeptics Group has been offering a $100,000 prize since 1980 for anyone with proof of paranormality. They've invited soothsayers of all kinds to take on the challenge, yet no one's been able to claim the prize. Yeah, can you see him? What the hell? The sceptics believe no one actually has special powers, so people should be wary when seeking them out for answers. It's coming through with your son. They're coming through together, okay? And I feel like I need to let you let the family know that they're all together. Of course, the sceptics say they're willing to pay up if anyone can prove them wrong. And joining us this morning is Richard Saunders from the Australian Skeptics and clairvoyant medium Ruthie Phillips. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Richard, first of all, what are the criteria for this challenge? I mean, wh- what would you pay out on? Any proof for the paranormal, the supernatural, anything like that. Yes. Uh, as long as it's done under mutually agreed uh, fair conditions, above board and everybody's happy. So if I were, say, a, um, a water diviner... Okay, and I wanted to claim the hundred thousand. How would you go about constructing the experiment? Depends on exactly what you claim to do. Mm-hmm. But we've had hundreds of water diviners try yes. under their own conditions. We'd hide a bit of water yes. uh, randomly under maybe ten buckets or something. Like yes. that. And we'd say, find, uh, find the water, and this is what. They use. Mm. It's generally a piece lots. of copper mm. which they which they, they move along and yeah. it shows where there is water under the ground. Now, Ruthie, would you say that the criteria set by the Skeptics Society is just too difficult um, for any psychic to, to kind of, to prove, or is it just not worth even trying to prove it? Well, I mean, I personally wouldn't set myself up for a fall like that because I think that there are so many parameters um, attached to this. Uh, you can set your own conditions to a degree, but it's, uh, it's an inexact science, the psychic world, the spiritual world. Mm-hmm. So you don't have control over all of the things like time and space and, mm. and stuff like that. And I think that if people are, you know, you're letting them actually choose 
what their task is, yes. you have to be very confident that you can do it 100% of the time because yes. on the day, lots of things can cloud your ability, whether it's water mm. divining or yes. whether it's predicting the future. Uh, it makes it very difficult because Ruthie, the emotions I, will cloud things. Can I ask you this? Is, is the, the whole notion of um, uh, clairvoyance, I mean, is it premised on the fact that there is a spiritual world that exists without our world or around our world or separate from our world? My belief is that there is a spiritual world vibrating at a different frequency right. around us now. Right. And we're spiritual beings having a physical experience here. So, Richard, do you not then accept that premise that there is a, a spiritual world which is somehow different to the physical world? Well, if there was sufficient evidence, too, and things like saying it's vibrating at a different frequency is just what we call word salad. These are scientific words that the uh, psychics just use. They, you know, what does it mean, vibrating at a different frequency? Mm. But the tests are designed with the person wanting to take the money to make sure they're happy. There it is. Okay. That represents the one hundred thousand dollars. We try to make it scrupulously fair. We want to show the world there is psychic or supernatural ability. Okay. We don't want to debunk anything. We want to give people every fair chance to show us and the world that they can do these All right. Okay. Well, Richard, I'm, one can vouch for me that I said ten <laughs> minutes ago <laughs> that Richard would wear a flying pig brooch on his lapel, didn't, didn't I, Mon? didn't I? They've come in. I'd very, very much like to know whether Ruthie <laughs> sees anything um, in Richard. Anyway, <laughs> well, Ruth, Ruthie just declined the challenge, which is confusing no, to us. You no, see? thanks. Uh, not, thank not you both on very tally. much, Ruthie right. and Richard. Lovely thank to have you. you in. Thanks, team. Thanks very much. Uh, now to a story. Yeah. Well, that wraps it up for the $100,000 prize at the moment. For more information, visit www.skeptics.com.au. Calling all skeptics and the pub organisers across the world. We need your data. This is Brian Eggle from Glasgow Skeptics here, and I'm looking for your input. The Skeptics in the Pub Organiser Workshop will be back as usual this year at QED, but we're doing things a little differently, and we'd like to hear from you, even if you can't make it to the conference. This year, we want to build as accurate a picture as possible about how many active Skeptics groups there are out there, and gather some information about how you run your operations. To do this, we'd like to invite a representative from each SITP group to complete a survey. The data we gather from it will form the basis of how we approach the workshop at QED. For those that are going to be there, we'll tailor the session based on your survey input and discuss the topics that you want to cover. We'll certainly have the opportunity to discuss best practices and perhaps amuse ourselves with some of the highs and lows we've encountered over the year. If you're not going to be there, we're going to share the data with you after the conference and maybe we can all find out some best practice together. To get to the survey, please go to glasgowskeptics.com forward slash SITP or go to qedcon.org and look for the Skeptics in the Pub Organiser Workshop page. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And as ever, my continuing thanks go out to the supporters, the sponsors uh, of The Skeptic Zone. Well, the supporters, really, the show really doesn't have sponsors. It has you. It has uh, the people who contribute at skepticzone.tv via PayPal and Patreon every week. And uh, that support means there is a Skeptic Zone without you people uh, contributing each week. It uh, wouldn't happen. I couldn't cover uh, the costs and my time in doing The Skeptic Zone. So thank you. And all those people who listen to the podcast for free, thank you also. Coming up on next week's show, I chat to New York author Kurt Anderson about his new book, Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History. This looks to be a fascinating book, and I chat to Kurt about conspiracy theories. 
And speaking about 9-11, I noticed that uh, after my TV appearance you just heard, somebody popped up on Twitter asking why we don't offer our $100,000 to, I think, disprove the official version of 9-11. In other words, a 9-11 truther popped up demanding that skeptics be skeptical of the same things he's skeptical of, which happens quite a lot. It's amazing how many people um, are skeptical about one thing or another, sometimes incredibly irrationally, like moon landing or 9-11 or, or what have you. And when they discover that we're not skeptical, the skeptical community in general are not skeptical of the same things they're skeptical of, they get irate. They can't believe it. They're incensed. They think then we are part of the uh, the naughty conspiracy, the global elite, or I don't know what they think. Maybe they think that uh, the press is suppressing crop circles. Who knows? Crop circles. I do like my crop circle tie. If you watch the video of my TV appearance you just heard on the Sunrise program, which linked in the show notes, you'll see my crop circle tie. Always gets a lot of comments. I like that tie. I found it, oh, five, six, seven years ago on eBay. It's a, And I haven't seen one since, and I bought two. And I gave one to my good friend, Dr. Steve Roberts in Victoria, the UFO expert, uh, and he loves it too. How can you be an expert in something that doesn't? Anyway, that's enough for me at the moment. Again, thank you to those people who support the show. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for contacts, an archive of all episodes since 2008, and our online store. Please support the Skeptic Zone by following us on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, liking us on Facebook, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can also show your support by subscribing via PayPal for as little as 99 cents a week. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian Skeptics Inc. or any other skeptical organisations.